Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome, everybody. Um, today, uh, we are excited to be here to talk about staying in the game, how companies can support women and parents during COVID-19 and the child care crisis. We have a packed agenda today. Um, before I even get started, though, I want to high five all of us because it is Friday. And for those of us with school age kids living in New Jersey, it's one o'clock. We basically made it through that first week of school. It's five o'clock somewhere. Instead of my water bottle, I really wish I had a cocktail now. Um, we're, we're excited, we being Rutgers Business School Center for Women in Business and Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations, the Center of Women in Work, um, to really be able to present not only the research that we've done on COVID-19, but and the impact to unpaid labor at home and the impact to the child care crisis, but in addition, have an esteemed panel um, of, of guests here from various companies um, that are here with us today. So first we have Salia Mingo, the global lead for Be Now, the Bristol Myers People and Resource Group. Um, so thank you, Salia. Hi, hello. Thank you for having me. Um, Salia's had line management roles domestically and internationally, multiple cross-disciplinary and multi-channel roles, so we're excited that she's with us. Next, we have Halim Wise. Um, Halim's an HR executive at Facebook and responsible for all human resources um, for all North American sales. He has done all things human capital in his career, focusing on talent and succession and diversity and inclusion. Um, has three daughters and a wife, a very active CrossFit enthusiast, and loves cooking with his wife. So thank you, Halim. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Um, and next for our panel, um, we have Nita Malik. She is the head of diversity, inclusion, and cross-cultural um, marketing at Unilever. Um, Unilever, by the way, is the number one company by working moms for working moms by Working Mother Media, and the number two best employer for women by four. Um, Nita has also won numerous awards, including Mother of the Year by She Runs It. She also is an active writer, very authentic about the real experiences and challenges she's been going through writing on a week-by-week -week basis um, with her own kids. Um, she writes for Sway, Working Mother Media, Entrepreneur, New York Post, Business Insider, Cosmo, Fast Company, and more. So thank you, Nita. Um, Want to talk for a second about the Center for Women in Business, and then want to turn it over to Deborah Lancaster, who is the Executive Director for the Center for Women in Work, who's also going to introduce Yana Rogers, an esteemed economist, um, focusing on gender studies as well. Um, so the Center for Women in Business, as you all know, our mission is to, um, through education opportunities and thought leadership, we will remove barriers and empower women with the confidence skills to enter and succeed in a continuously evolving workforce. So we are very happy to be here. I want to turn it over now. We're going to start out. Deb is going to, Deborah is going to introduce the Center for Women in Work, talk about our research in a fireside chat with Yana, and then I'm going to come back and do some Q&A with the panel. Um, so thank you, uh, Deb. I want to turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. And Lisa, thank you for putting this together and to all our amazing panelists for being here. Um, the Center for Women Work leads research, education, and programming that promotes economic and social equity for women, workers, their families, and communities. And um, we have an over 26 year history um, here at Rutgers engaging in issues that directly affects living standards of working families in New Jersey and across the country. Um, and of also of providing professional development to individuals and organizations. Recently, the center has been working on projects linked to how paid and unpaid care work fits into our economic, political, and social landscape. Who does the care work, how we value that care work, and examining the consequences of how the care economy is currently structured. We're housed, as Lisa said, in the School of Management and Labor Relations, and uh, we're part of the Institute for Women's Leadership Consortium. And now um, it's a pleasure to, I'm going to really, uh, just launch right into our fireside chat with uh, Dr. Yana Rogers, who's an economist um, in um, 
the Labor Studies and Employment Relations Department, as well as the Women and Gender Studies uh, Program here at Rutgers, and is the faculty director at the Center for Women and Work. Um, I just want to take a technical, uh, is there feedback? Are we good? Um, just want to make sure all of us are okay. I'm going to keep going now. Yeah, we um, are hearing a little feedback. Yeah. So, I don't know if that's on my end, but I'll, I will see if, uh, if all of us put ourselves on mute, except for who's speaking, maybe that'll help. Um, excellent. That works really well. And uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, being patient with uh, our technology. So, Yana, um, I, I know a little bit about you, but our audience doesn't. And I've seen your CV, and it says you have a PhD in economics from Harvard. Um, but you describe yourself as a feminist economist. Can you help us understand what a feminist economist does? Um, yes, it's interesting that these little words use the word but, but I describe myself as a feminist economist. So when I finished my PhD in 1993, there was no feminist economics. Uh, it did not exist as a field. Uh, in fact, we got our journal two years later in 1995. Um, so mainstream economics at the time did not recognize uh, unpaid work or the work that mostly women did to support the economy. Uh, mainstream economics only looked at um, activity that passed through the market. So what feminist economics does is shine the spotlight on unpaid work and other activities that is essential for people's livelihoods and work that's essential for markets to function but was entirely unrecognized and also at the time, there was little recognition of gender relations and gender differences and gender discrimination in the market. And that's another area that feminist economics looked at. So it's 2020 and before the pandemic, women's participation in the labor force reached a record high for the second time in history. So huge participation by women in the labor force. Yet women uh, continue to do a disproportionate amount of unpaid care work in the household. And last time I looked, it was 40 percent. Women spend almost 40 percent more time on unpaid household and care work than men do. And those numbers are even higher for Black women and Latinas, who spend nearly twice as much on unpaid household labor as um, their male counterparts. Um, if you could just take a minute and remind us how what happens at home is connected to economic and career outcomes for women. Yeah, I think that the key word to think of is a constraint, that the work that women do at home um, serves as a constraint on the extent to which they can participate in the labor market and the extent to which they can advance. So uh, we often think of these unpaid activities as a whole structure of constraints. Um, and it affects, you know, how much we get paid, how we are viewed at work, um, how many hours we can work, um, the salaries that we earn, and ultimately that can have repercussions for savings and retirement. So again, uh, often this unpaid work in the home, it's unappreciated, it's unvalued, it's invisible, but it matters instrumentally for um, not only women's livelihoods, but also families and the um, people that we support who are off in the marketplace, like men going off to work while women stay home um, and take care of the kids in a stereotypical way. Although these days, um, most mothers are working while taking care of children and juggling and trying to do both. And are there policies that encourage, um, and we all know there are policies and practice that encourage um, a better balance of who participates in unpaid care work, but from your lens, um, what are the policies that um, have the most promise? Uh, probably the two key policies are paid parental leave as well as universal child care. And we are so far behind in the U.S. Uh, we still don't have a national um, paid parental leave policy. 
Some states, including New Jersey, um, have paid parental leave. Many states do not. Um, and we don't have anything close to a universal child care policy in the state or even um, you know, support for families with young children like they do in many uh, Western European countries. Uh, earned sick leave also helps. Again, no national policy uh, except uh, during the pandemic, but that's temporary. Uh, New Jersey is a leader in terms of providing earned sick leave, but many states don't have it. And evidence shows that even though earned sick leave and parental leave sounds like they're gender neutral, they really help women disproportionately more than men. Um, and this is why this conversation is so important. Um, without these policies, so much relies on companies to be able to respond to the needs of families. And so the stay-at-home orders earlier this year got the Center for Women Business and the Center for Women Work together um, and interested in exploring how or if the gender distribution of labor might change. Um, what motivated this research? And more importantly, um, what were the key findings? Yes, it's exciting. With Lisa, uh, research with Lisa, with UDEB, um, with uh, Christina, Lisa's colleague at the center, and uh, Elaine Bundle. And we were talking about all these news stories coming out about uh, women um, struggling with balancing their work at home with having children at home, women needing to homeschool men also. But again, we were hearing that women were disproportionately doing more of the work in homeschooling and taking care of young children who were at home because daycares and schools were closed. And we wanted to see, well, what happened to the gap? Has it grown? What are men doing? What are women doing? And uh, we found, as expected, that the gender gap has grown, that women are doing proportionately more of the care and labor at home than men, but we did find that men's contributions increased as well. Uh, women rose more though, um, but there were certain areas where men were actually doing more than women, uh, elder care and disabled care. We didn't expect to find that. And one of the key things we found, which was surprising, but cause for optimism, is that the work that men were doing at home contributed positively and significantly to women's job productivity and their job satisfaction. So a lot of uh, reason for optimism there. And um, so the pandemic doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. Um, and we have a lot of other things um, happening um, in the world right now as well. Um, what are the most pressing research questions that you have right now? Um, or what do you think we should be doing next? Well, that survey that we did, uh, we refer to it as a real-time survey. We took it in May when uh, many families were scrambling um, to uh, make arrangements. And now we are into September and uh, we're at a different time. I think uh, a key research need is to see what's happening right now. And that's why I'm uh, looking forward to the panel and hearing what some of the participants have to say. Uh, most schools are still closed. Um, how have things changed since the pandemic first um, started and the lockdown orders first came down the pike? So it's important to look at what's happening right now. What kind of adjustments have families made? Um, are they finding more child care available um, with schools continuing to be closed? How are families adjusting? And has this gender division of labor gotten any better um, compared to what we were finding in May? It's a key research question. Thank you, Yana. And now I'm going to turn it back to Lisa so we can hear about how firms have been helping uh, uh, na employees navigate during this time. Lisa, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, WebEx has just changed the platform, and so I apologize for the technological glitches. I'm just trying to get up to speed myself. But one of the key things that I keep talking about is we all have to be flexible. Um, so 
Before we begin the panel, um, Christina Durante, the research director for the Center for Women in Business, and I had the privilege of speaking at a Fortune 100 company earlier this week to present the research that we did in conjunction with Deb and with Yana. And I wanted to share two word clouds with you because I think they're really important to set the stage for um, for for what we're going to be talking about. And the first question we asked is, what is the best? What is the best part about working from home during COVID-19? And what we found was flexibility, no commute, family. That were, those were some of the best parts about working from home. But some of the worst parts, isolation, the kids, the balance. If you were to ask me, what is the best part about working from home and what is the worst part about working from home, they're one and the same. It's being with my family. And I think a lot of us feel the same way. So I just wanted to share that as a backdrop. And with that, I want to, I want to open it up to our panel. Um, from a technological standpoint, actually, before I even do that, you have a little button either at the bottom of your screen or to the right that looks like a speech bubble from the cartoons back in the you know, 80s and 90s when I was growing up. Um, click on that chat bubble. We want to be responsive real time to your questions. We'll be monitoring it. Um, we want to make this as interactive as, as possible. Um, and if you want to see everybody at the same time, just go up to the top right of your screen. And within those little circles, you can click on the one that looks like a grid view, and then you can see all of us simultaneously. So want to kick it off um, with my three panelists. Helene, you, you happen to be first on my screen, so I want to start with you. Um, how are you? Sorry, you said Helene or Dolly. I didn't hear the... Oh, Ali, I know you guys sound kind of the same, right? Ali. No, you're, you're, you pronounce it right. Um, pretty good. I mean, I think similar to what you're saying before, I do have three kids, two of which are, I'm in New Jersey, I should start there. So two of them are going in person and one of them is going virtual. So it's been a heck of a week just adjusting to what life is going to be like, at least for the next few months in terms of that. But all things considered, I would say pretty good today. Oh, great. And Thalia, what about you? Hi. I'm, can you hear me okay? A little bit tinny, but I think we can make it out. Okay, I'm doing well. Thank you. I don't have young kids at home anymore. Nita, Nita, what about you? How are you? Well, Lisa knows I joke, but it's day 20, week 26, day five, so I am counting, working from home, and uh, like Helene, who's, I'm also in Jersey City, I have a five-year-old, seven-year-old, and they both went back to school this week, and the virtual from home in school kind of mix, and I miss them and my husband is thrilled. So that's where we are. We go from like surviving to thriving. And you know, I think for all of us, it's really difficult to make these decisions on whether to send your kids back to school or not and what's gonna happen in the future. I think, I think that's true. Um, let's, just, let's just get into it. One of the things um, that Yana and Deb had mentioned is one of the most critical things that we can do to help support working parents is, is childcare um, policies. And, and paid paternity leave, paid parental leave. Helene, can we go to you? Yeah, definitely. Um, during, I think, you know, fairly early on at Facebook, we realized that this was just something that was unforeseen and clearly something that no one had ever dealt with before. So there were really three areas that we felt we needed to address, whether it's working parents, mothers, et cetera, to help work through COVID a lot better. The first was just making sure that we carved out 10 weeks of paid COVID leave for anyone that would need it during this time. So that was the first thing that we've done. The second is we also gave $2,000. It was in two separate tranches, but we gave $2,000 in order for people to purchase, whether it's office equipment, you name it, because the reality is while some people were working from home before, no one was working from home in that manner on a regular basis, especially with kids in the background. So we really wanted to make sure that we gave people the resources financially in order to deal with the current environment. So those were two of the, the major things that we did in order to address um, what was happening as it relates to COVID. And then the other thing that we did was also around our performance management. So we realized quickly that in order for people to really work alongside with their kids doing virtual learning and whether it's elder care, you name it happening in the background, there's no way that people were showing up as their, their best self, so to speak. 
So we eliminate, we do performance reviews twice a year. We eliminated the performance reviews that happen on the first side of the year because we realized that setting expectations for people just wasn't really fair during that period of time. So I'd say those were the three critical areas that we really looked to address what was happening as it related to childcare during COVID. Um, and then I know we also mentioned um, childcare. We also partnered with Bright Horizon um, in order to give 10 additional days for backup care because going to a, a, a center, so to speak, was just not working. So having people come into home, of course, in a socially distant and safe way was another critical way to really help people cope with all of this. I think, I think that's Keith. Sally, are you back with us? I am back. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, okay, awesome. Thank you, Helene, for, for taking that one for me. Um, <laughs> so I'll start where Helene left off. We at Bristol Myers Club, we also partnered um, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we, re recognizing that our daycare centers were closing, we partnered with Bright Horizons to expand our backup care, what we call backup care benefits. So that parents had the opportunity to um, leverage folks that they trusted and who had had already been exposed or were in their homes without risk of increasing exposure or the risk of increasing exposure to COVID and be reimbursed for that coverage. Um, currently, what we're doing now is we're continuing to partner with Bright Horizons for backup care. And what that means is that if a parent needs some type of additional care during the day, um, their their usual care has fallen. Um, for whatever reason was interrupted, they have the ability to secure someone to help with their care. Um, uh, of course, uh, the other thing that we've done, which I think is, is really pretty phenomenal, understanding that parents don't always have a choice with the homeschooling and, um, and that hybrid way of working, that they have flexibility. And, and maybe we'll get to this at another point, but I think allowing them to work flexibly in, um, day to day is something that we've we've allowed our employees to do as well. And, and I want to put a pin on that for a second because I wanted to I want to now turn it over to Mina for a second. Um, mm -hmm. I mean I know Unilever's had a lot of these same policies, but one of the things that I know you focus on is, is culture and empathy. And, and what specifically has, has Unilever done, and what have you done in your role to to bring that kind of to a human element? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. And I think similar to what Facebook and Bristol Myers Squibb is doing, we're, we're focused on those same things. But I would say what I was so amazed by, it was probably the first day, we know it's week 26, so let's go back. It was probably on Monday where our leadership team got together, all of our top 50 leaders, and said, what are we going to do for parents? It was immediately on top of people's minds, just as it is for these other companies, which was the empathy piece, which was so great. And I think, you know, our core principles have been, one, you have to create a really psychologically safe space for people to talk about what's happening in their home. So my kids aren't here right now today, but generally they'd be busting in during this panel. Or if I come into a call and say my seven-year-old just had a tantrum, and that's why I'm in a bad mood, just to be open about that. And we've talked about everyone's on their own COVID-19 journey. We're talking about working parents right now, but some, of, some people we know are alone and isolated, and there's a different journey they're going through. And there's mental health issues and things that people are facing. So just to be open and honest about that, Second, really walking away from this idea that there's core operating hours anymore for a company. It's yeah. people's core operating hours. There's no such thing as like, these are this is business as usual. So to be open and say, I know my, my daughter takes a nap during this time, it's a good time for me to uh, connect with you. Or I actually have to log into a Zoom call for my son, so could we push that meeting and allowing for that two-way dialogue. Right. And then I think the last thing is ruthless prioritization some of the things that we used to work on, and we all know this, how the markets change pre-pandemic, they just don't matter anymore, and maybe they never did. And so this idea, I wake up in the morning, I'm like, what are the two or three things I'm going to get done for my company, and the two or three things I'm going to do to keep my kids alive today, and really helping people focus on that, and we're just seeing really great results. I think, I, I think, I think that's great, and I think that, that dovetails really nicely into, into the flexibility. What it, what does that mean for each of your organizations and more specifically for each of your teams? Because I think my gut tells me it'd be hard to dictate, hey, here are the hours that we're going to have meetings. So what does that look like in practice? 
Yeah, I could, I could tackle that. Um, and and I, I just want to piggyback off of what Neil was saying in terms of the flexibility and there not being core hours, because I think that's a good starting point and just managing the expectations that whether it's nine to five or 10 to three, there is not a set time in which people are going to be working. It really is going to have to de be dependent on what they're dealing with in their background. And I think that's, that empathy point is so critical because everyone is going through some level of stress and trauma related to this pandemic and understanding that what we see here on this side of the screen may seem like a nice polished finished product, but there could be kids or an elderly person on the other side of the screen, God only knows. So in terms of that, and especially if you're in a global company, you have to be mindful of the fact that there are a lot of things going on and does not have the expectation that you're going to work nine to five, five days a week. We've instituted things like Fridays, no meetings, because that helps people as well. We also have introduced different COVID leaves, even if it's just for a day at a time. I know a lot of people that, for example, on Mondays, they just don't work on Mondays because they don't have any childcare or they just need a mental break, quite frankly. And so we've also rolled that out just to help with the flexibility in terms of making sure that everyone is as productive as possible, but also stay safe. And then the final point I would say on that is, as much as we're talking about the hours that we're working, I think we should also be mindful of the fact that people need a break. I think at first people were like, why would I take a vacation and stay at home? And then people realize, you know what, I need to detach myself between what was work and life because now they're so blended that I have to create some kind of separation, whether it's at my house, whether it's taking a drive to water somewhere or just a forest or something just to clear your mind. Having that space to yourself is so critical during these times because if not, you could find yourself working all the time as well as trying to manage what's going on in the personal front. And then it just becomes one big blur and you start to lose your sanity. Yeah. Daddy, do you want anything to add? Oh, absolutely. I, I agree with everything Helene has said and, and Anita as well. It's um, what we've done with, with we stress the messages of, of, of flexibility really, really strongly in the company. And I think we can't over communicate that enough right now because work and home life are so blended. Um, parenting care, we talk about parenting care a lot. Elder care is another significant challenge that many employees are, are struggling with. And we want to make sure that it's an equal, you know, you have, you have the same flexibility that you need for elder care as well. One of the things, a few of the things that we've done um, in partnering with our benefits team um, through the Bristol Network of Women is recognizing first and foremost, it is not always all women um, because we've had, we've had some dads reach out to us and, and ask for support as well and talk about their journeys through this, this pandemic. Um, but we have what we call, um, we've established a lot of Yammer um, communication streams where folks are just really getting out there and sharing great ideas uh, about um, during the summer. We know a lot of the summer camps are closed. They share some ideas on what works for summer camps or some other ideas to engage your kids um, during that time. Um, elder care support, you know, if they're, uh, your parents may not be close by, you know, can someone in another city or a state um, ask, you know, share some ideas that they might um, know of, of resources that are available. We have a parenting support network, and I have to tell you, I get out there sometimes and I read some of the most hilarious posts because they're sharing these very creative ideas. You know, one of our executives posted that she had figured out a way to um, disable her internet at night because she wanted to get her girls to not be on. And she said, and I've even figured out their hack. So, you know, just really getting into a lot of, of, of creative ways to, to get through it all. And then for those who are single, um, you know, you're right, there can be this period of isolation for them and maybe they're missing their, their, their ways to interact. So we have a virtual program, it's called Skills to Give, where we allow them to volunteer virtually to nonprofit organizations just to get out and to begin doing things. So there's, there's a lot that we've offered and, and we continue to push the communications out. No, I think, I think that's really key. And one thing that you touched on, Dahlia, is, is work-life blend. So at our combined centers, we're actually starting to call that overlap. Because yes. right now, work and life is not balanced. That would mean that there's some sort of a quality integrated sure. means that you're able to web and flow it. And I also have kids in school, physically out of school, yes. physically, mm -hmm. virtually swapping next week, and who knows what's going to happen. Right now, everybody is doing everything in the same place at the same time overlapping on top of each other. And so it's really 
it's really it's really challenging. Um, Nita, I, I'd love to hear what else you're doing with your team. Um, I know you became a camp counselor this summer. You posted about <laughs> it a lot. Um, give me some ideas for my prior days as a camp counselor. Probably not as good as you. I failed at that. I don't know if I'll add it to my LinkedIn profile, but it came to a close, so it's done. But I do think that one of the things uh, we're struggling with, which is also like bombarding people with too much, and I think that there's a there's a there's a shift right now as we've seen is that you can't always see people and you can't always hear them, right? Because they're we're all virtual, and there's a micromanagement piece of like for some people, like where are my people? What are they doing, right? And so also coaching leaders to say like with deliverables, if something's due on Friday, you set it to do on Friday. You don't need to talk to the person six or seven times unless they have questions and want to reach out to you. I joked early on, but please don't invite me to another virtual happy hour. Like, just don't. Like, and, and it comes from a really good place, right? I love the virtual cocktail kit that arrives at your home, but I'm exhausted by the end of the day. And you don't know, as I say, behind like the Instagram photos of the best banana bread recipe you've ever baked and the drive-by birthday parties, you don't know what's going on in people's homes. So it's well-intentioned things, but sometimes people just need the space and time to disconnect. We're all zoomed out. Lots of great programs out there, but we're at the point now too where we're thinking how much is too much and how can we give people space and time? Uh, just as Maureen was saying earlier, this idea that no one was going to be taking vacations. No, people just need to be disconnecting and recharging and reading a book um, or, or doing something you know quietly on their own. I, I, think that, I think that's critical. I actually just posted on social media recently. I, I'm, I'm a former athlete. I was a gymnast and there was a picture I found literally as I'm flipping through the air upside down, my hands are gone, my feet aren't hitting the balance beam yet. And that's literally what I'm feeling. Um, and, you know, I think flexibility is key, but one of the, one of the, you know, I focused on flexibility. We have to focus because our kids need to go to school. We need to work and determination because we're all developing more grit and resilience than we ever thought we could possibly get. But at the end of the day, even the most elite athletes still need to rest their bodies. And I think we need to condition ourselves to do that as well. So I think, I think those are really great points. Um, along that line, what are, what are some strategies that you're, you're, you're using or encouraging your team to use to get that rest, how are you modeling that behavior as well? Because you're all leaders in your organization, so you're role models. What, 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 are, you, what are you doing? I, I think part of it, and the, if there is a, maybe a silver lining in all of this, is that because we're all working remote, it kind of evens the playing field to some extent in the sense that before there was a stigma of if you worked from home, some people thought that you weren't working at all. But now that everyone is working from home, you understand that that is definitely not true. That said, as we all are working from home and as we're talking about that kind of flexibility and that balance, one of the things to model the behavior, and I'll give myself as an example, is that two weeks ago, I went away to North Carolina, took the family away, off the beaten path, just hung out, and I made it a point to say, look, don't disturb me during this time period because I want you to be able to have that same time when you take off, that you should be able to have peace of mind that when you are away and you have your planned time off, that you're not still tuned into the matrix. And so I think one of the critical things is you have to lead by example because like it or not, when you're in the office, a lot of people stay until the boss, so to speak, leaves. And when you're working remote, some people are queuing in and saying, well, I don't want to take time off until I see my boss take time off. And the way that you take time off is also critical in terms of how your direct reports and others around the organization are going to view it. So I think it's just really leading by example, quite frankly, is a perfect way of really showing care, but also showing that you need to take that time to relax, to adjust, and maybe even publicize it, quite frankly, whether it's through pictures, whether it's through an email, whether it's through a post, almost celebrating the fact that you're taking the time off and then you're coming back refreshed, energized, and able to do more than you were before you left. And also acknowledge if you were burning out or just were, quite frankly, too stressed to continue work, and that's why you also needed that break. I would, I would just jump in and piggyback off of what Helene said, also just including a few tips from my end, an out of office that doesn't include your cell phone, in case of emergency, <laughs> there's no emergency. You can text me in two weeks when I'm back from North Carolina. Oh, yeah. so I think role modeling, because a lot of times we take vacation, we don't, and I'm guilty of this, we don't use the out of office. It's like kind of on vacation. I think the second thing I realized is I used to have a, a over an hour commute. 
So why don't I block that on my calendar? Because that should be my time back so that I could at least um, change, take a shower, eat breakfast before just like rolling up to the laptop. And I think the last thing I've seen people do um, to Helene's point about being public is actually if your calendar is public, putting, you know, my daughter Priya is napping right now between one and two, or I am going to check out a tutor for my son or whatever it is, being very public about it so that you're role modeling and that people feel encouraged that they can do the same. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, no, I, was, I, I agree 100% with what Mita and Helene have said. Um, it is role modeling. I can't tell you I'm a great example of it. I try to be. Um, but I don't, and I don't put my phone number in my out of office message. I just, you know, tell them I will, you know, connect when I'm, I return. Um, but I also think it's, it's something you said um, earlier, Mita, it is creating that psychological safety for folks to feel like they can and it's okay. And being very clear in your communications around your expectations that they do take the time to stop and, and to, um, you know, re-energize and, and get reinvigorated to do the work we have to do. I think, I think that's great. I discovered two tricks. I actually got it from one of our board members, Frida Abunyan, who I put on, I started putting on my emails because because I'm dealing with my kids and my kids are older, they're 12 and 14. And so they're actually quite helpful um, on, on the home front. But there are certain hours I might be working at 11 o'clock at night because I need some of those regular work hours during the day. And I started putting on my email, I'm sending this at a time that's convenient to, for me please read and respond when it's convenient for you. Because yes. while I try to role model behavior, I'm horrible at creating that separation. And I know that about myself. I tell my teens I'm horrible. I say, do not do what I do, do as I say. Um, and then the other thing I just discovered on Outlook is you can delay sending emails. So I started writing all these emails and hitting send at eight o'clock the next morning. So nobody feels that anxiety of, oh my God, Lisa, just email me again. Um, so I found those um, folks have been responsive to, to some of that as well. Sally, I want to turn it back to you. You have a really interesting role um, leading an ERG, of, you call it a PBRG, but, um, you know, a, an employee resource group, a business resource group, a people resource group. And Bristol-Myers model is really different because you have full P&L responsibility. This is your job. It's not considered office housework. And so, it is not. I, which, which I think is phenomenal. I think that's awesome. What, mm -hmm. and I know we have a lot of folks on here who are running their own employee resource groups at their companies, probably as a side hustle without getting paid for mm -hmm. it. And so mm -hmm. what, what are some ways that, and Bristol Myers is phenomenal with this, but what are some ways that you guys are doing to not only just be that support group, but advocating and using it as a resource for Bristol Myers? So, um, Bristol Myers, and, and this is something I'm very proud of um, working for Bristol Myers, is that we have we have such a strong commitment to diversity and inclusion, and this was one of our ways to uh, put that that to action by actually creating people and business resource groups with full time leads who have responsibility for full business plans and a budget, as you said, if you know, to pull together programs based on that dimension of diversity that we represent. I represent. Um, all women at BMS, of course, and I'm also championing male allies to join us and work with us. So um, that responsibility carries forward. Um, I'm not sure if, if many of you are aware, but Bristol also made a very public statement um, with our commitments to diversity and inclusion in five distinct areas. And with that, of course, our, the PBRGs, as we call them, are at the table and at the forefront with helping to pull this through. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, one thing I want to focus on is you just said male allies and, um, yes. we talk about this a lot for real change to happen in the workplace, real change needs to happen at home. And before you can be a male ally at work, you need to be a male ally at home. And I have three boys, as I said, 12, 14 and 46, the 46 year old is a little bit harder to course correct, but I'm, I'm trying my best. And. We have a lot of conversations at home. One of the things that he said or did recently, he's not here to defend himself, recently was um, when we were talking about, he works in finance on Wall Street and they were asking them to come back and he heads up a division. And he asked his team, which by the way happens to be all men, but asked his team, hey, what are your constraints about coming back? And every single one, including my husband, 
said, yep, yeah, we have public transportation issues and we have to help with child care. Help with child care. I said, oh, no, 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 honey. You are not helping. I'm not helping with child care. If we we're both helping, there is no child care and then our kids are running amok. So what can we do at home to ensure that when things go back, men aren't going to go back first and women are going to get backlashed and stuck at home um, and have to do with all of this stuff because the kids still haven't returned to school. So I, I'd like to open it up. Um, Nita, I don't know if you want to try to tackle what you're doing too and, and how we yeah. Well, I'll be super honest. I'm falling into in my old household uh, cultural stereotypes, gender stereotypes. I mean, it happens. I am like, I'm like, why am I the one making all the meals or why am I the one taking the trash out? And part of it is my personality that I'm not asking for help. Now, there is no help. It's co-parenting. But I think my husband and I have gotten to a good place, especially during this pandemic, every night kind of sitting down and reviewing our schedule the next day. Who's taking the morning shift? Who's taking the night shift? Who is taking out the trash? Because that needs to be done. Who's helping with meal prep? So I think in a lot of ways in our relationship, that's been, if I can say there's gifts in the pandemic, which we have to sort of look at what silver linings are. We've been, we've had to be more structured because we hadn't had childcare. We hadn't had school. So I am hopeful and I will hang on to that as we both head back someday into a physical office. And Helene, what are you doing? Like you're very public, um, even on your public profile, you know, your your interest in addition to your kids is you like doing meal prep with your wife. So um, so kudos to you for already being that male ally. But what what um what what can you tell us how, how can we how can we ensure that women aren't going to continue to have more of the burden of the unpaid labor at home? Yeah, I mean, this this concerns me a lot because, you know, if you look at the labor participation rate right now for women, it's basically at the lowest it's been since the 80s. And if you look forward to where we're going from an economic standpoint, there's a good chance that it'll continue to stay there, which is obviously very troubling. So for me, I think what I've tried to do is I look at it as a partnership. And I think to your point of co-parenting, like this shouldn't be helping with child care. This shouldn't be you watch the kids or babysit because just even your language from the beginning starts to set a tone in terms of what the expectations are. So I think just sitting down and almost coming up with ground rules of what the expectations will be, whether you're a dad, whether you're a mom, et cetera, and really understanding that and saying, okay, I will be, I think we talked before about, for example, who's the CFO of the house, so to speak? Who's the CEO of the house, so to speak? Who's gonna take care of the entertainment? And kind of just sticking to that and having the trust in your partner to say, you know what? I did the cooking, for example. How about you take the kids out to the park for a little while while I'm doing the cooking or after I'm doing the cooking? So that way we're dividing and conquering. And also, quite frankly, the other thing that's happening during this time is a lot of people are not getting time, especially in a parental situation or a family situation, time to themselves. And so even in that kind of scenario, it allows both partners to get time to themselves or time with the kids on an individual basis, and then they could flip. And again, that also just helps you to understand and get a better appreciation for what different roles are. And a lot of dads, I will speak, even though I have been very active, a lot of dads are like, wow, I didn't realize how hard it was to maintain certain things around the house because I've been out of the house more times than not for 60 hours a week. Now you understand to keep the house running, there's a lot of things that go into that. And that empathy hopefully will stick, not just for now, because I think the other thing is to really focus on what does life look like post-pandemic. I know that may, may seem crazy, but at some point there will be a post-pandemic. And so we also need to understand what the implications of that are going to look like. Totally, totally agree. I'll jump in, Lisa, because yeah. I know you were going to come to me. Um, both uh, Mita and, and Helene have hit on two very important points. You know, start with yours. I oh, know, but I, they don't know over there. Okay. Um, Somebody's not um, muted. Um, yeah, I'll start with yours, and it was the fact that um, you mentioned um, you didn't ask so for help. Gonna... You said you weren't getting it because you didn't ask for help, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm sorry, someone is not on mute. Can you? And three grandmas. I'm hearing. Can you guys hear that? Yeah. Um, but but anyway, you mentioned the point of you didn't ask for help, and I think that's a very critical thing. We have to communicate, both parents, if, if you're struggling, if you're feeling like you're carrying 100% of the burden, you and your partner need to be having the conversations. It goes back to that, that term of empathy and, and really understanding what the other person is going through. And it's not just listening and, and nodding your head and saying, yeah, I get it, I get it. 
it is really, really understanding, you know, the, the intensity of the feelings, the frustration, um, and, and stepping up and say, okay, how can I help and what can I do? And so we as women have to ask for that. I tend to be the superwoman too. I get what you're saying. I tend to not want to ask for help until I'm drowning. We have to be willing to ask for the help. And, and Helene, you mentioned it as well, empathy. It, it, it goes a long way. I think it all works. We can pull it all no, together. I think, those, I think those are those are great points. Um, and I want to go to the return to work in a second. I mean, one of the things I've done is I, I joke I'm the CEO of the house. Unfortunately, I'm also the CFO of the house because I pay all the bills. So, but um, I have I have a team, and we decided together as a team to get buy-in. I'm using all the management principles that I did when I was in corporate, and we decided we clean the house for an hour on Saturday and an hour on Sunday because we had to do it ourselves at this point. And they, I have the lawn landscapers now. Great. Um, and then hopefully you can still hear me because I have a loud voice. And so. What happened is I gave them all fancy titles and we were doing it and then we all share in the cooking responsibilities and even though people are going back to work, they're still doing it. But I'm fortunate that one, my kids are a little bit older. I'm not watching Flippy every two seconds on TV. Um, and we, we have more resources because we have more people, right? So I have more hands to do some of the work. What, 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 what are folks doing? What, what are you hearing um, that maybe are single parents or what about single folks who don't have kids, um, you know, how do we make sure as a company that they're not further isolated and that we're supporting them as well? When I was a young worker, granted I was an investment banker, so I was completely dumped on, but what do we do to ensure they need to have a life too and they have other responsibilities and we don't know what they're going through. As Mita said, they're on their own COVID journey. So what do we do as companies to support both single parents and folks without kids? I'll take the single parent question, and this is just from my own personal view of parent, uh, single parents that I have in my life. So, I mean, it takes a village to raise children, and all of our villages during COVID have been ripped out from under us. So, whatever, uh, however the com comfortable the person might feel, maybe helping and doing social distancing walks with children, inviting them over to your homes in your backyard, providing meals, dropping off meals, um, things like that. Uh, somebody. Um, on one of our teams sent like a huge care package for a single mom with a bunch of arts and crafts, like just really small gestures. And also like asking them like how you can help and not making assumptions because some people might not be comfortable with the help you wanna offer, especially uh, during COVID and social distancing. But I think it's just reaching out and trying to figure out the ways that you can be there for them. I, I would agree with, with that. I'll jump in, Mina, you, you're absolutely correct. It, it's First of all, understanding how to help, asking the question, and, and even reaching out just to have the conversation. I have a lot of um, friends who are single parents who've said, you know, just reaching out and having you talk, just give me the time to talk and vent, and then I'm good. I can move on. So even that goes a long way. You're muted. All right, sorry about that. For me, um, and granted, I, I'm a product of a single parent, but it wasn't during the pandemic. So it does hit home for me and, and it's always top of mind. So I think one of the other things I would just add, because I don't want to um, just pile on to what, what you know, has already been said is, also I would say for a single parent or a single person, but specifically single parent will tackle that first, is you can cut yourself some slack. For example, one of the major things, depending on the age of your kid is screen time. And I know a lot of people are like, I don't want my kids to just have like, three more hours of screen time than they did before. But the reality is in this environment, that may be your only outlet to really create that space in which you could actually be productive in, whether it's eat, shower, or take care of yourself, you name it. Don't beat yourself up for increasing screen time. That's just one example. When you are single, and one of the things that we've done, whether it's we do, we don't do virtual happy hours anymore. So Mita, I totally understand your point. <laughs> but it, when you said it, I wanted to applaud over here. But there are things that could be done during the day. Sometimes we do like even a 15 minute catch up, whether it's like a coffee break or literally we may play Trivial Pursuit for like five or 10 minutes. And as, as corny, so to speak, as that may sound, it helps to build camaraderie for people within the team, but it also makes those single people feel as if they have connectivity because for many of those people, the interaction that they get on the other side of the screen, especially in the heart of the pandemic, that was the only interaction they were having with human beings at all morning, day, and night. And so being mindful of that and trying to just connect with them on that level also goes a long way. Let's talk about the future of work and returning to work. What, is, what does that look like 
or what are you hoping? Let's go to that. What are we hopeful that that will look like when we return to work? Because normal, the new normal is not the old normal, hopefully. <laughs> um, I just want to say hope. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was gonna, well, I was just going to jump in and say, I, I think you're absolutely right, Lisa. Um, there is no such thing as normal anymore. I think we can get do that, do away with that term. And whatever we come out as on the other side of the pandemic, I think there were some pearls that we've learned from this. One, one, number one being, we can be productive working at home. Um, I also think the term of work-life balance gets a very new um, overhaul, a, a, di a very different look. Uh, coming on the other side of this because um, so many folks have a, a very different perspective of working remotely. Um, do I think it'll be some strong sense of a hybrid? Absolutely. That's my own personal opinion. I think, um, you know, we as a company, we, we had the majority of our workforce working remotely and we've, we've shown it can be done, but does that mean that's the way we will go forward? I can't speak to that. I don't think so. I personally would like some time in the office and interacting with my colleagues in person. Um, but then I appreciate the time away. So I think overall, if, if anybody's asking me to vote, I would say, what's the hybrid look like? Same here, I mean, thank you, Valia. I totally agree. I think the hybrid approach is a big one. Um, the other thing is that we are anticipating that a lot more people are gonna work remote period, whether it's remote in the city that they were in before, but quite frankly, are going to move to another location, typically a lower cost environment and they're going to work from there but they'll be just as if not more effective when it's all said and done and again i think the stigma of the fact that working from home and in time back to what bali was saying not being productive not being able to get as much done thankfully that has gone away so when we do return back to the office and someone says you know what i'm going to work from home two days a week and come into the office three days a week i think you're going to get a lot more support around that than you would have if you had that same kind of conversation a year ago yeah, I would just yeah, I would add. I'm not going back to the office five days a week anymore. I don't I, I don't think anyone is. Period. Everybody's looking for a hybrid approach. I would also say my hope is that I many of us no longer have to hide the soundtrack of our lives, which is being working parents. I can remember someone very senior calling me when my son was five months old during dinner, and he was crying, and I was in a one bedroom apartment, and I like closed the bedroom door and went into the bathroom and then pulled the shower curtain, which what was the shower curtain going to do? I don't know. But standing there talking to him, <laughs> thinking that I was embarrassed that he could hear my child crying. And that was years ago. And certainly I'm a different person then. But my hope is that we've just opened up uh, sort of a window into all of our lives and we'll be more accepting. And then to Helene's point, I think access to great diverse talent pools. Because no longer do you have to be hired in New Jersey to do a job in New Jersey. You could be sitting anywhere. And guess what? We could never have met. Like, we could have just met over video, but not in person. And you could be working for the company for, like, a year. So those are the things that I'm really excited about. Yeah, I think, I think that's great. One of the things that we talk about at our centers and we talked about as we were doing this research is, and because we did it in May, it was a really different time. Summer camp wasn't canceled. We didn't think we were going to have to be the camp counselor for our children. We thought they were all going back to school in the fall. And so there was this kind of optimism that, hey, we're almost done with this thing. And now we're sitting here at September, you know, here we are on September 11th, which has its own um, challenges in and of itself. Um, you know, we're in the middle of, you know, a racial reckoning, right? Um, for those people that, you know, it's, it's, it's been going on forever. And then for some people, it's, you're just realizing that this is happening, which is also an issue in and of itself. Um, and then we have this global pandemic on top of it. So from everything I'm reading and everything I'm hearing right now, everybody is like, like I'm wearing my red shirt because that's how I'm feeling. I'm, I'm, I'm way up there. If we can just support women and parents through this, the other side, I think we're all collectively thinking is going to have such positive benefits for the future of work, for elimination of the mommy track, for realizing that, you know what, we are actually quite productive at home. And we don't have, if you're living in the New Jersey area and commuting into the city, three hours of travel a, a day. So it could be really, really positive. And, you know, I, I want to thank you all um, for for taking the time, because I think some of these insights were really tactical and, and really 
practical um, for others to implement at their companies or think about if they're not already doing so. Um, I want to close with, um, with one thing because we talk about gratitude a lot in my house. And at least if we try to say it enough, hopefully we will internalize it and become it. And so I wanted to go around with everyone and, and, and just give me lightning rounds. Like, what's the one thing, surprisingly, that you're grateful for during this time? Um, Salia, you're on, you're not muted, so can I start with you? Okay. Um, wow. I, I was just thinking, I'm like, I have a list if you, if you really want me to be truthful, but I would yeah. say the one thing that I'm most grateful for is the ability to actually reconnect with a lot of people that I would not have connected with because we've had to slow down. And, and to this point, we're meeting virtually and I've reached out to more people, I think, in the last six months than I have in the last three years of my life. So th that's been amazing. Awesome. Colleen, you are also unmuted. Yeah, I would say, look, my, I, our family has always been tight, but this period of time has made us even tighter. And it's made me become even more appreciative of the craziness, but yet the very highly entertaining component that we now all share because we're in the same space. And I think humor is a big part of this because it's easy to lose your mind during this time. But there are so many great moments that happen now that you're interacting with your family on a more regular basis that for me and for all of us, we're even closer than ever before. And I just hope we can continue that. And, and that is a main takeaway. It's like my wife and I have talked about the fact that, wow, we really didn't spend as much time as we thought we did with our kids because she works as well. And now it's like, now we really are spending a lot of time with them and we love it. Yes, there are times we want to kick them out of the house, but we do overall love them. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm grateful for the clarity the pandemic has given me on the relationships that are the most important and matter to me. So what Talia was saying about the ones I hadn't nurtured enough. And also um, sometimes the ones you have to let go of because you've yes. at this point, you're growing in different directions, maybe you'll come back. But I think that's what I've been really grateful for on clarity on what's important um, and who's important in my life. That's great, Deb. Um, I, I mean, I can relate to what everyone said and I am uh, grateful for time with my teenage sons and my spouse. We've done a lot of cooking, especially earlier on in the pandemic. And, uh, you know, they know how to cook now and enjoy it. And so I'm grateful for that because um, we love food in my house. So I think a lot of people do. Um, and my neighbor's garden. We took a lot of walks together and noticing spring flowers for the first time. So I, I don't think I ever noticed spring like I did this year. And and my, and the empathy that I feel like um, my colleagues and I were able to have for each other during this time and, and the role that plays in. Because um, this is a journey for everyone, as, as folks are saying before, and everyone um, needs support. That's right, Yana. Um, I'm similarly grateful for everything that people have said. Um, and one thing that often makes my gratitude list, which I do keep every night, I write down five things I'm grateful for. Often it's my job. You know, I have a job that I love. Um, I can be creative and do a lot of writing. So I am grateful to have my job and to have a job that I love. I think that's great. Well, thank you all. I, I'm grateful for, for all of you participating and all of you listening. And, you know, for me, I always run it like 100 million miles an hour. And so it has forced me to, to slow down. And I think that's important. And, and I'm grateful for, for, for that as well. Um, we hope you got a lot out of this event. The recording will be live. Um, our next event at the Center for Women in Business is going to be on October 22nd. We will send you all an invite. It is about staying in the game, or sorry, not staying in the game, that's what we just did. It's about standing out in a virtual environment, um, performance reviews, promotions, and beyond. We're coming up on that season, and how can we stand out? Studies have shown that women you know, aren't as good, people of color aren't as good about advocating for themselves, and that's even harder in a virtual environment. So we're going to talk through that. Um, if you are interested in, in more of the research and you want to participate, um, the Center for Women in Business is conducting another study about early life experiences and how they impact future careers. So 
please email the Center for Women in Business, women at business.ruckers.edu, um, and we can send you some more information. If you want to find out anything else about the Center for Women in Work or the Center for Women in Business, please visit our website. Thank you again. Have a fabulous weekend, and congratulations to all of you parents who survived the first week. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Uh -huh.